So, thank uh, you. Yeah, thanks so much for this opportunity. We haven't done a, our little show for a while. <laughs> so, you know, and we definitely enjoy it um, because we both, you know, are in, I was and she is in this career and really um, like to promote it because it's not off, it's not real well known. But of course, I love it. I thought it was a wonderful career. So yeah. um, I'll let Natalie speak first because she is going to work yeah. and needs to check out. <laughs> so she's got about 20 minutes, but I wanted her to be able to um, be a part of this because she's a little closer in age <laughs> to everybody. And uh, anyway, I'll let Natalie take it away. Okay. Hi, um, my name is Natalie Hamill. Um, I work as a CLS at San Ramon Regional Medical. Um, and so let's see, how did I hear about this career career path? So shockingly enough, I heard it from my mom. <laughs> um, my dad is also a pathologist, which means he works in the laboratory side of things, um, but he does have an MD behind his name. I decided not to pursue that <laughs> particular career path, um, but I did go into the lab like my mom did. Um, it seemed like a natural path for me. Um, I'm I always was strong in sort of biological sciences, not necessarily engineering type sciences, but um, mm -hmm. turns out you don't need that necessarily for this career. <laughs> if you're struggling with math, that's okay. Um, let's see what kind of student would you, honestly, I was an average student. I was like a B average student. Um, I didn't do a ton of like, you know, I wasn't on a roll. I didn't do a bunch of like fancy extracurriculars, anything like that. Um, and I ended up doing really well on my ACT and that's what helped me get into Fresno State where I went to college. Um, and then at Fresno State, I was a bio major eventually. <laughs> I sort of bounced around in the health area, but I was kinesiology, health science, physical therapy. Um, so I actually took six years to graduate, but technically I finished the biology um, major in three years. I would not recommend doing what I did. <laughs> um, it took me a little longer than expected and I ended up with um, a lot of upper division science classes at the very end of my college career, which was really a struggle. So if you're thinking you are interested in this career, I would suggest going for it from the get-go um, <laughs> instead of bouncing around like I did. Let's see, um, how long did it take you? So um, to get into this career, you need to major as bio or chemistry. Um, you end up doing equivalent number of classes for both. I actually did, almost got my minor in chemistry as well while I was in college. Um, there are also certain classes you need to take to get into the graduate portion to get your license, um, like immunology, hematology, things like that, that aren't necessarily within a biology major, um, but you can find those on the graduate program websites. And then you have to go to graduate school. It's short. It's only 13 months. Um, you do four months in a classroom, and then you do 10 months as an externship in a hospital. Um, and at the end of that, you can take your licensing exam whenever you want. You can do it right away. You can wait for later. Um, take your national boards, then you get your license and you are ready to go to work. Um, and I took mine like three weeks after I finished. I wanted to get through it and get done. Um, and I actually, so I finished my program in October of 2015. I got my license in November and I was hired in December of 2015. It was like nothing. Um, let's see, daily responsibilities. So um, I work in a pretty small hospital. So I, I work as a generalist, which means I cover every section of the laboratory. Um, so daily duties, I run tests on blood, urine, body fluids, things like that. That's, you know, that's the main bulk of the job. Um, another part of the job that some people don't know about, um, maintaining the instruments. You do a lot of troubleshooting or running quality control and doing maintenance, things like that to keep all of your instruments up and running. Um, sometimes that requires calling service in or getting a little creative <laughs> or calling in some of your coworkers to help you out. Um, and then just sort of keeping on top of things, moving around. Um, sometimes I also um, do specimen processing. So I receive things, make sure everything's been drawn or, or labeled with the right patient labels, make sure everything matches um, because we don't, we're not patient facing. We don't see, we don't have any patient contacts. So we have to use labels on the tube, that's our guide. So if this says John Doe, your labels better say John Doe too, or we have a problem. <laughs> um, so it's very, it's a very detail oriented job. Um, it's honestly not that hard, especially the longer you go through it. Um, but it's definitely sort of, it keeps things varied. Um, there's, you know, I, as a generalist, you work in chemistry and hematology and your analysis and blood bank. And, um, you know, it's kind of, you have a good variation, but it's not like a scary variation. <laughs> um, there, you don't feel overwhelmed. 
uh, let's see, responsibilities. The other thing is you've mentioned too is, and I think you is, you don't have patient contact, but you definitely have a feeling for what's going on with the patients in the oh, hospital. Oh gosh, yes, absolutely. Because you, you almost get the same picture the doctor does because you are, I've, if I'm in hematology, I still see, wow, this patient took blood from me this morning. Okay, their hemoglobin is really low still. I should probably set up more units for them just in case. Oh, wow, their chemistry is really low. So maybe they're going to give them a K-pack, which is a bag of um, uh, potassium first and put it in through an IV. Like you end up being a very integral part of the patient care process, even though you never see the patient. Um, You're tracking their progress through their lab work. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. And now in the time of COVID, we do have COVID patients in my hospital right now. Um, and I gotta say, we care about them just as much as their nurses and doctors do. We really cheer for them when they, uh, when their levels go up and you're like, oh, yay, they're off the ventilator. Oh, yay, all their, you know, chemistries are coming back normal. Like, even if you don't see them, you still have sort of a connection to them. Um, let's see. Um, oh, how to, uh, let's see, advice to give it. So um, I'm a CLS, but we have many different um, jobs within the laboratory. There are also laboratory assistants and there are phlebotomists. If you are interested in this as a career path, being a phlebotomist is a really great way to sort of ease into this um, because you can do that while you're in uh, college or, a, you know, it's a very short program. I think it's like three months. Yeah. To become a licensed phlebotomist. And then you are the one drawing the blood and handing it off to me. Um, so it's a great way to see if you like this career. Um, and it will look really, really good on your resume when you are applying to graduate programs, um, because they'll really like that you have experience in the laboratory already. Um, and you'll learn, oh, uh, you know, a hemoglobin is on a blue top, which is an EDTA um, um, anticoagulant. Like you'll learn all of that as a phlebotomist and that will only help you as a CLS. Um, let's see. And what are my plans after this? Do I plan to go back to school? Mm, probably not. You can. You can get a master's and take some business classes and that sets you up to be a laboratory manager. Um, you don't have to do that. Some people get in just by being in the field for 20 years or so. Um, so it's kind of up to you. You can also, um, take, sorry, it just spotlighted. Oh. <laughs> um, you can also take this in a lot of different ways. You could go laboratory manager, you could go infection control, you could go, you know, um, R&D, you could go into industry instead of into the hospital setting. So um, like right now, again, with COVID there, I'm actually getting recruited all the time to go um, help develop, develop um, tests for COVID testing. Um, so going and developing molecular testing with like Beckman Coulter or BioRad or any of the companies that give us the products we use to do all of our testing. Um, and I think that covers all of our questions <laughs> that were on the questionnaire. Yeah. Yeah. Um, since I have to skedaddle um, to go to work, I would open it up. If anyone has a question for me before my mom talks and I have to run, um, uh, either, I don't know, I guess. You put it in the chat or you chat can, or uh, however, Anna, however yeah, you want to handle you wanna it. Yeah. it Anna. <laughs> um, so I know that you'll be here until about like 1.15. So if anyone has a question, you can add it in the chat box um, or you can unmute yourself right now um, before she heads off to work. No questions, any questions? <laughs> no, that's just checking in. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay, I think we're okay right now. Oh, wait, we have a question. I could, do you know any other oh. state schools with this 13 years? There is, okay, so I went to San Francisco State. Um, I think there's one in San Diego. There's one in SoCal. Uh -huh. um, Sacramento used to have one, they got rid of their program. I believe UCSF is also trying to develop their own program, but I don't know when that will be, especially with COVID, when that will be. Yeah, when I was, when I was going through this process, there were tons of schools and, and they even paid stipends. They still pay uh, stipends. Well, some of them and not, Most of them. not as much. Well, yeah. <laughs> I could live on my stipend. <laughs> yeah. um, but um, then they really cut back on the schools because it's expensive. You know, these are run by hospitals typically. And so the, it's expensive to run the programs. Although the payback is awesome because it's almost like it's like on the job training. You get the 
pick of the crop. You know, you have a bunch of students who are going through this training and you get to see them on the job and you get to say, hey, that one's really good. We want, we want yeah. to hire that one. And a lot of students are hired directly by those, um, those institutions that had the training programs. Yeah. But overall, it became quite expensive for a lot of them. And so a lot of them shut down. So yeah. there's a lot less schools, but you can find them if you look onto the website, like for the um, various associations. And I've got a list of the associations as part of my PowerPoint. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. I think someone's trying to ask a question. Oh, uh, yeah. what are the courses like for school? For, um, okay. So <laughs> in college, it's mostly going to be biology and chemistry courses. Um, it kind of runs the gamut. Um, as you get further along, they do get tougher. Um, and it kind of, a lot of it, as I learned in college, really depends on your professor. Um, I had an immunology course where I was learning things that my father learned in medical school. And then I took a cellular biology course that I basically passed with my eyes closed. So <laughs> it, it depends. I will say the graduate programs are very competitive and they are they are no joke. Um, I took a final every three weeks for four months straight. Um, <laughs> so be aware of that, but it is done in four months. So, and then you go off to your hospital and you get tested there, but it's not quite as- um, It's on the job. Yeah, training, it's really. not quite yeah. as rigorous. <laughs> yeah. right. Thank um, you. Yeah, no problem. So, ha hello. Yeah. I want, I, David Pintado from Mount Diablo High School and Diablo Valley College. Mm -hmm. I want to say thank you so much for the time that you are putting here because I know the students right now are like a human sponges. <laughs> everything from what you said. And um, I mean, I, I wish we can continue you guys having, you know, these type of conversations with updates with what's happening in the profession of yeah. the, your science, because in our high school, we want to promote a lot of biotechnology pathways, which we have already, but we need to promote it more. So uh, I already saw 13 students from our academy. They are in the chat and in, in, in this uh, session, 13 is just the beginning. So we have a lot of students that are interested in biotechnology and, and lab sciences. And I'm really, really happy that this video is being recorded because we can share, but, uh, this mainly from high school, and I represent also the college. So there's a lot of students in the first year of college that they still don't know what to do. So later, I want to use uh, Anna's, you know, contact information so we can set up something for college. You don't mind. Not at all. I, mean, yes. I don't mind. Not me either. Um, yeah. I'd love to love throw it. something to tack on to that. Um, because there are so few schools, like mom said earlier, there is a huge, huge, huge demand for clinical laboratory scientists. I am a hot commodity right now. <laughs> um, it is crazy. I put my resume online. I got contacted by 10 recruiters in one day. It is insane. We need that is, in this. In that, 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 that should be a magnet. For exactly. The students. So, and, and most of the students there in that, in this, they, they are listening very careful what you're saying right now <laughs> so we, yeah. we definitely need more and also just just to sell it a little more um you also labs are 24 hours so you're not a morning person i am not a morning person i work swing shift my shift starts at 2 p.m i don't and i work till 10 30 at night it's great it's you can work the schedule around how you want to live your life which is really nice it's not a typical nine to five you don't have to get up early in the morning and you know, drive through the rush hour traffic every day to get to work. Um, you know, it's flexible mm -hmm. and it's in high, 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 high demand. Um, in fact, I'm getting asked to um, fulfill roles that I'm not necessarily qualified for and I have to gently tell them no, they're already asking me if I want to be a manager and I've only got five years experience. So I'm like, maybe, maybe let's take a, pump the brakes there. But um, that's how much they yeah. want people in this um, career. Upward mobility. Quick commercial, quick commercial, quick commercial. We're gonna, be invited, <laughs> we're gonna be invited to talk to more than 25 high schools and colleges in the Bay Area in October. I'll let you know that because- Perfect, that'd be fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Wonderful, Thank you. Can you picture everyone or shall I say just for the end of the meeting? Um, that'll be for you because I'm gonna have to scoot.
Uh, right. I said we can take a picture at the end, but that we have one last question because I know you have to leave. Um, it says, can you major in biology or chemistry? And I think that'll be the last question so that you can head off to work. Sure, but I can cover. Um, it's probably easier for you to uh, major in biology. You're going to get more of your classes that you need as a biology major. Um, like I said, I, I almost got my ma minor in chemistry. I was one class short, but I was not going to stay a whole other semester just to take one laboratory class. <laughs> um, but um, as far as what you do on a day-to-day -day basis in the laboratory, it's going to be better to have your foundation in biology rather than in chemistry. Um, it just it just suits it a little better because it's much more, that's my alarm that <laughs> says I need to walk, wrap it up so I can go to work. <laughs> um, um, but because you'll be studying things like cell, cellular development and you know, the TCA cycle <laughs> and all that, all that sort of stuff that is the foundation for what you do in healthcare. Mm -hmm. um, rather, if you wanted to do chemistry, you would probably end up more on the R&D side of things or the research side of things because then you really are developing how do these chemicals react to each other? How can we get a colorimetric reaction? That sort of thing. So it kind of depends. Test what you development. Think you're gonna, yeah. Kind of, mm -hmm. kind of depends on what you want to do, but I would say biology would be a better um, route. Probably. Yeah. So life science. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I should probably go. It was really nice to talk to all of you. I hope you guys are interested in being a CLSs. Um, I'm going to hand it over to my mom. Right. Have Thank fun. you so much, sweetie. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it so much. Thank you. All right. Have a good Bye. Shift. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my. Okay. So, um, I'll, uh, I, I'll sort of dovetail what, you know, Natalie went through, what, what um, her career was like, or what, you know, her history is like, and I'm retired, um, and uh, I, I, I um, my history is that I heard about this career in high school. At the time that I was in school, um, there was actually a student uh, association uh, of clinical laboratory. They were called med techs back then, medical technologists. And uh, so I joined that association and I got a lot of information and good direction on what classes I was gonna need to take. And um, I got a really great tip uh, to go and do some volunteer work in a lab. So I did that. And that I found super useful because I was able to go into the lab and kind of feel uh, you know, like, what's the environment here? Do you like even being in this world, you know, because you're wearing lab coats and you have to use sterile technique and wear gloves and be careful. And, you know, I mean, it's a different, it's a, it's a specific environment. And so I found that very comfortable. It was no problem. So that was really helpful for me. Uh, and also seeing the people, the people that, and how they worked and, you know, um, how they got along with each other. And uh, that, that was, I would highly recommend doing something like that if you can do some kind of a summer internship or just volunteering um, in a, a laboratory environment. So I was pretty focused. I, I am <laughs> I'm quite different than Natalie in my approach. I was very academic, very focused on school, um, always uh, studied and really, I like science and biology. So by the time I got out of high school, you know, I was like a, an arrow. I knew exactly what I wanted to do. I knew I wanted to go to college. I knew what classes I needed to take. And I jammed through in four years and, um, got my, um, you know, my bachelor's, and then um, I took the exam, um, excuse me, I, I went into a training program like the next month, and the train, we call them training programs, no, it is graduate school, and that's what Natalie's referring to as graduate school, so I went into one of those programs right away, right out of, right out of um, uh, <coughs> college, and then finished the training program, and then immediately had a job and uh, at UC Davis where I trained. And so um, then uh, I stayed there for um, 12 years working in the microbiology lab. And that was my first uh, love was microbiology. And um, so I was a, started out as what they call a bench tech. And that means you're just doing the regular work that comes in and, and um, I liked microbiology because it was, uh, I like day shift. So it was a day shift job and it's very orderly. Uh, you come into work and, and you'd say, I, 
go to your the incubator and you get your petri plates uh you probably all work with petri plates by this time and and uh then you'd uh, sit down at your bench and you'd have your all your little tests your spot tests set up and you just stay there and do your work and you know and then uh and and by the end of the day you were finished and it was all very um structured it's not at all like what natalie does her experience in the lab is very different because she is a generalist so she's running around all the time she's setting up a test in hematology and then she might have something going in chemistry and so a lot of time management going on there and uh being able to you know multitask and uh uh so after uh, a few years as a bench tech, I became a teacher, a trainer, which was very rewarding, love that. And then I became a supervisor in the microbiology section. And um, I transferred to UC San Francisco, another piece of information. Oftentimes, if you're working in a job like this in a hospital laboratory or in the private sector, like a big laboratory like Abbott or Biorad, um, if you need to move, you can transfer. And you can take all that accrued work value with you. So your, your sick leave and your vacation and, you know, your, basically your pay scale because you've had so many years of service at a particular um, a facility. And so that's an important thing to remember in this whole, you know, this healthcare, this laboratory science field, you, you can get some continuity there. So even if you need some flexibility too, so even if you need to move around, you, you, you know, it's not like jumping from this job to a totally different job. You can have a little bit of consistency there. And um, so worked another six years in micro in uh, San Francisco, and then I went back to UC Davis. So I'm a big proponent of this being able to transfer. And then I finished out a uh, full 30 years of working for um, the U U University of California system. And the last thing I did at UC um, before I retired was to work on a lab outreach program where we were trying to recruit uh, uh, doctor's offices to send us their lab work. Who knew I'd be doing something like that? So that was kind of a marketing job in the middle of this, you know, um, career of medical um, clinical laboratory science. So there's a lot of variety of things you can do, even within, you know, a hospital-based uh, system. And um, I also did uh, clinical trials on laboratory tests. All these companies that make these kits, like Abbott, you know, they make the big instruments and they make the little test kits that you use on them. They all have to be um, checked out uh, to make sure they work. And so I, I got involved in working with a company. They have to test them out in real laboratories against real samples. And so I started doing that. Another totally interesting, totally different kind of thing um, to do. Uh, as a clinical laboratory scientist. And you can write papers, you can publish. I did a couple of publications uh, around the work that was done also. So that, that was uh, another interesting aspect. Um, another thing that I did was I worked part-time periodically. And that was really helpful. Just like the shift flexibility, Part-time work is also also very often available for, um, for um, uh, clean, lab, clean lab scientists. And um, so I, let's see, I also have worked in the private sector a little bit here and there. After I retired, I couldn't stop working because I do love this career. And so I worked at John Muir Hospital here in um, Walnut Creek, which is where I live. And um, I even went back to UC San Francisco and did some per diem work for them, uh, again, uh, working on the clinical study kind of work. Um, so very, very enjoyable. Um, and then daily responsibilities, I've kind of sort of been mentioning that as I've gone along. The things you do are very different, you know, and uh, so you might have a real structured environment or you might have this real flexible env uh, environment. Um, when I was doing clinical trials, uh, that was so different because sometimes I'd be running uh, samples on an instrument in one section and then the next day I'd be crunching numbers. I'd be doing data analysis to make sure that the statistics all panned out that the test was working correctly. So big variety of things. Um, and uh, advice uh, for a young person who's beginning their career. Uh, I, I double down on what Natalie said about phlebotomy, especially if you're in a situation where you need to work 
and go to school at the same time. You can't afford to, you know, just be a student. Um, phlebotomy is an, it's a, it's a, it's a career. I mean, it, it is, it's a legitimate career. I mean, everybody appreciates a good phlebotomist, let me tell you. Um, and, uh, and so, but it's also, you often see phlebotomists working and then going to school at the same time. As same with lab assistants, they'll do this, they'll, they'll work, be working in the lab, but they'll also be going to school and then they will get to the point where they can get uh, finished and then go into a, uh, the uh, grad program, the training final pro step, and then get out and get licensed and um, get uh, into the clin lab science career and I'll be going over I've got a little PowerPoint that I'll show you but you'll see when you look at the salary scales I've tried to give you the salary scales for the different careers and when you get to clin lab scientists that's the, the top of the heap so to speak as far as what you're going to take home uh, so that's another reason that people are I'm you know driven to um, move up to that um, that uh, job category um, and as far as additional schooling, um, Natalie mentioned that, and I did go back to school, and I got a master's degree in health services, uh, health science, excuse me, administration. And that's very common um, uh, path for people to take. And it really was helpful for me for, um, uh, to, um, uh, I was moving into administration and management and that was that so that was those were helpful um, to give you the big picture of how a lab runs that was very useful um, for me so um, let's see how about if I go ahead and move into the PowerPoint at this point does anybody have a burning question I'm happy to answer a question if anybody wants me to um, no, or should I just go ahead and roll <laughs> Yeah, I think I'll just go ahead and share my screen and do this PowerPoint. Okay. And can everybody see this? And it's big enough. I don't know if you see the whole, I, do we, you see the whole screen? I'm trying to decide. You don't really need these little. I can see all of it, Sue, just so you know. Okay. I'm going to yeah. do, how's that? Is that better? Yeah, that's better. Yeah. Okay. So, um, this is um, a PowerPoint I put together to try and give you an idea of a little bit of the sort of the big picture of what um, a, a, um, a career in cl clinical laboratory science. And so this incorporates a couple of other, not just clinical laboratory scientists, but other categories of workers in the laboratory. So you can see, you know, who's, oops, now let's see, how am I, oh, there we go. Okay, got my controls. Okay, so, um, this is just a general um, sort of information that it's a clinical laboratory science, a blending of science, medicine, and technology. Um, it requires good reasoning and technical skills. We really haven't talked about that, but you do have to have some good manual dexterity. You're handling a lot of precious material. So, you know, you don't want to drop somebody's tube of blood. That means they have to get drawn again, you know. And um, also uh, a lot of the um, work that we do requires very accurate um, pipetting or um, you know, careful handling of, um, of, of the material. So good manual dexterity is important. Um, and reasoning, just like what Natalie was saying about the labels, you've got to really think through things and make sure that you're very careful every step of the way. There's no, you know, oh, that's good enough kind of stuff. You really have to be detail oriented, as she said, um, because you're dealing with samples and then results that a physician is going to act on. So you don't want to give them results that aren't, you know, correct or on the wrong patient. They may get the wrong um, treatment, and so it's it's quite, you know, it's it's a responsibility. You do have to take it very seriously. It's quite important work that we do. Um, it's challenging, interesting, and always changing, always new tests, always new. I mean, just think about COVID, what you've been reading in the paper or hearing on the news about COVID and all these tests that are being developed and uh, the test for antigen or the test for antibody. And, you know, there's, there's all these sort of interesting um, things that have come up with COVID that are all laboratory science, you know, so you never see it in the news, but recently, you know, of course, and so we understand what that's about and uh, unfortunately understand maybe a little more than we should as far as how good these tests are and you know the the the, the issues that are around uh, developing these assays um, but it is lifelong learning things uh, keep changing and keep coming up you take in fact as a clin lab scientist you are required to 
uh, fulfill, uh, I think it's 24 uh, continuing education units uh, every two years. Uh, you're licensed every two years. And so you have to document that you um, attended continuing education programs. So that helps keep you fresh too, as far as um, keeping up to date. Okay. So when a doctor orders lab tests, question, do you know who collects and processes your blood sample? Well, I think we've established phlebotomists are the ones who collect your, your blood sample. And the person who, who processes it is called a lab assistant. So phlebotomists and lab assistants. And then the next step, who analyzes the blood, blood and body fluid samples? And that is, that is, um, clinical laboratory technicians and clinical laboratory scientists. There is a level of um, certification, uh, just a step below clinical laboratory scientists called clinical laboratory technicians. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that too. And what do we do? We generate information to assist physicians in the detection and treatment of all kinds of diseases like cancer, diabetes, flu, strep throat, so from mild diseases to quite serious life-threatening diseases. And this is probably the most important piece. 80% of all physicians' decisions are based on laboratory test results produced by the laboratory team. So what we do is quite important as far as um, uh, physicians being able to treat patients. In my area of microbiology, one of the most important things we did was if we would identify a bacteria that was causing an infection, then we could test that bacteria to see what antibiotics the, or, the organism was sensitive to. So then the physician would know what antibiotics to prescribe to treat the patient. Without that information, you know, what would they do? Um, so, as mentioned, we're behind the scenes in laboratories or with patients collecting samples. It's a highly skilled team working together. So it is definitely teamwork. Um, because it does, labs run 24-7, you always have a handoff from shift to shift. You have a handoff. Here's what's happening. Here's what's in process. Here's what's going on. You know, we've got somebody who's, you know, um, bleeding out in um, the ER. They're going to probably be calling for more blood, letting the next shift know what's going on. And all of it has to do with the real, real time, what's going on with patients um, in the hospital or the emergency room. And, okay. Um, so we perform testing. So how do we do it? So now I'm going to start and I'll show you a few shots of different parts of the laboratory. So here's uh, biomedical instrumentation and technology. And these are used in all parts of the lab, even a place like microbiology where everything seems so old fashioned and whatnot. We, we also use um, uh, sophisticated instruments now there uh, in that area too. They're, they're everywhere. And like Natalie said, they don't always work. <laughs> you know, you end up troubleshooting, you end up being kind of a jack of all trades as far as, you know, tinkering around with that equipment. And some people like it more than others, can make it a specialty, you know. Um, so there's your manual dexterity and um, these, um, this is where you can, you can see there's a rack of tubes there. You can get really high volume uh, output of uh, laboratory tests by using machinery. Um, and where do we work? So hospital labs is probably one of the primary employers of clinical laboratory scientists. Reference laboratories, these are big laboratories that um, you may have heard names of before, but Quest, sometimes they'll be the ones who actually draw your blood and then they send them off uh, to a major, a big central regional laboratory. Um, and those are refer and these reference laboratories oftentimes do some specialized testing too that maybe isn't done as frequently, and so it isn't worth it for a, a hospital lab to set it up. But a reference lab that gets samples from a whole region makes sense that they can set it up because they've got the volume to run that test and to make it cost effective. Uh, physicians' office laboratories, clin lab scientists can work there too. I. I've seen them, you know, and they'll have a little tiny lab with some little tiny instruments, you know, and they kind of have their own, looks like a little mom and pop shop, you know, and they're running a, a legitimate laboratory. Uh, it's just, they have a very small test menu. Um, State Department of Health, um, like where they're sending a lot of COVID testing right now, um, some state, uh, state laboratories. 
uh, pharmaceutical and biotech industry. This is um, more on the, uh, the side that of making the test, building the test, the equipment, and then the test kits that run on that equipment. All interesting, and as Natalie, sometimes more of a chemistry bent, might be more interested in, in, this, uh, in, in, the, in working in this kind of a um, setting. Vet labs, just like person labs, you know, people labs, um, they have, uh, in fact, vet labs are super interesting because um, you think about human blood and we know, you know, what the cells are supposed to look like and we know what the chemistry values are supposed to be in blood. Well, um, cats and dogs, their blood has a unique look to it too. Cat red blood cells are unique and, and, and uh, the amount of different chemicals in their blood is unique for cats. And same thing with dogs. And so vet labs are really kind of fascinating. You have to know an awful lot because you've got all these different kinds of animals that, um, you know, what sounds abnormal for a cat might be just fine for a dog. Uh, forensic labs, and this is another whole big interesting area. Um, this is like um, NCIS, you know, if you've watched TV shows where they're doing forensic pathology, where they're trying to, um, you know, they work and they are trying to uh, find out, you know, the source of a, you know, a crime or, you know, the, the, per, um, the cause of death in um, some kind of a suspicious death. And so they uh, might do things, especially like toxicology, to see if people have some abnormal amounts of certain chemicals in their blood, drugs, you know, um, and so forensics can be quite, quite fascinating and might involve even doing things like going and testifying in court if you're, uh, you know, uh, testifying in a case about um, that hinges on um, some forensic uh, evidence that's been discovered in the lab. So here are the careers. Mentioned these before, phlebotomist, lab assistant, the technician, and, and laboratory scientist. Now, there's the phlebotomist, and then there's the blood collection we all know and love. <laughs> um, it used to be lab tech, or clean lab scientists had to uh, be trained to draw blood. I was trained, and I had to go and, and, and do a blood draws um, on the floor. That was part of my clean lab science training. That is no longer the case. Um, but to be a phlebotomist, you have to have a high school diploma, a formal course in phlebotomy. And I think this is more um, related to the number of successful venipunctures that you've done. I think you have to do at least 100 and, um, and as well as you know, the coursework that leads up to you being prepared to go out and actually do that um, hands-on training. And so that's the clinical training. And then uh, a certification is recommended. It's not required, but if you wanna get a job, you probably should get that certification. A lab assistant. And this is uh, oftentimes phlebotomists also act as lab assistants. It's kind of a combo. Uh, again, high school diploma, uh, courses in lab skills and computer applications preferred, and it's on the job. So these people don't have a lot of specialized training to become a lab assistant. It is kind of an easier entry into the lab world. And uh, so here's what lab assistants do as far as specimen processing. A few more shots of what's happening in a laboratory. You can see we have these racks of tubes. Those are all were drawn, blood draws. This is a centrifuge where they're spinning it down. We separate the blood, the red cells will come out at the bottom, the serum at the top, and we pull off that serum to run our chemistry analysis. And just a few more shots of here's somebody pouring off that serum. Um, so that's what the lab assistants do. Very important um, point of the work because every time you you do something like you you pour off a sample, you got to be sure you made that that pour off sample is labeled correctly, so it ties back to that original sample. You never want to lose that chain of identification in your samples, um, so that you're again sure that the results you're turning out are on who that actual sample was actually drawn from. And this is just kind of a little funny, you know, what is this? What's he doing? <laughs> Testing a mini washing machine, loading the lab CD player, or preparing a patient sample in the centrifuge. And of course it's, you know, a centrifuge. And so he'll drop these into the slot, close that lid, turn it on, it rapidly, rapidly spins, and it separates out um, your um, uh, cells from the uh, fluid in the blood. 
So a clinical laboratory um, um, technician, now you know we've, we're leaving the phlebotomist and lab assistants behind and we're gonna move on to laboratory technician. Now this person needs an associate degree in AA, eight semesters hours. So that they had to have taken eight semester hours of biology and chemistry during that, you know, in the part of, as part of that AA degree. And those courses need to be in hematology, microbiology, chemistry, immunohematology. So once you get into this a little bit further, you'll understand some of the more subtle things like immunology. It's like, wow, what's immunology, you know? But immunology is really kind of the study of um, how um, your blood uh, cleans up you know, what's going on, you know, the white cells gobble up uh, bacteria and they create antibodies to fight bacteria. So those are some of the key components of immuno, um, immunology. Completion of an accredited MLT CLT program and then national certification. Okay. And then the clinical laboratory scientists, now you, you need a bachelor's and this will end up being a bachelor's of science because of the, the required um, science courses you'll have to take. And then it's 16 hours of chemistry and biology. And so then you see you're getting a little bit more detailed. You have to take physics, you have to take statistics. So even if you, even if you don't like <laughs> math, you need to you know, kind of get through these, these courses um, to, um, and you'd be surprised at how important they are to um, what you do. Uh, physics um, has a lot to do with optics, and when you are working with clinical laboratory instruments in chemistry especially, a lot of the chemistry tests, the way that they're detected is through optical um, means, and uh, so it all kind of Oh yeah, that makes sense. Now I see why I needed to know that because that's how this system, this thing works. Um, um, genetics, there are clinical lab scientists working in genetics labs, not just human labs either, in, in veterinary labs, uh, thoroughbred racing. There are people just specializing in genetics of thoroughbred horses, who knew? Um, but again, you know, these other ones that we've been mentioning a little bit. So. Um, so here's your then you again that accredited program and certification okay a few more photos of uh, laboratory sections here's hematology they all kind of look the same chemistry and hematology you can see these massive instruments um, that just perform different functions there are still some um, hands-on testing that we do things you have to do by hand like microscope work and what we're looking for under the microscope is and here's these, here's, these are your body's red cells. These are white blood cells. And what you can do in looking at these is this is normal. And then if we looked at this slide, somebody with the experience and knowledge would say, oh no, these are very seriously wrong. This is somebody who probably has a leukemia. And um, uh, so it's um, uh, part, of, part of what you learn in the laboratory in that hands-on testing or hands-on training, excuse me. Here's microbiology. Guys, have, has everybody seen a Petri plate before? Maybe worked with a little bit? Yeah. And so these are bacteria growing, you know, and uh, you, it's kind of like a little detective story. Every plate you pick up, it's like, oh, what is that? Let's test that a little bit and figure out what that is. Um, and it's not just bacteria that you work with in a microbiology lab. It's also viruses. We culture viruses uh, like COVID. Only we don't culture COVID, we're just testing for it. We don't, we don't want to, yeah. and a parasite uh, or a fungus that might be causing illness. So all kinds of different um, things to look for. And here's chemistry, again, back to those big machines. You know. And I w just wanted to throw this one in because it's just such a massive instrument. <laughs> and uh, in laboratories, it's kind of fun when you, if you, get to do a laboratory tour or go and visit a lab, I also recommend that. You'll see there are these massive systems where the, you have racks like, like, it's like train tracks, you know, and they will take the samples all, run them all around the lab and they'll split off this way to go to that instrument and split off this way to go. It's pretty fascinating. Okay, so um, 
this is just to uh, give you a list of it. We've talked about hematology, throwing these names out, you know, that don't mean a lot, but um, there are all kinds of different specific laboratories. Depending on how big your hospital lab is that you're working in, you may have these separate sections. Or if it's a smaller hospital lab, like the one Natalie works in, you may combine a bunch of these. And so you end up doing a whole bunch of different tests, which kind of makes it more interesting, in my opinion. I worked in a big old lab always at UC, and so I, that's why I ended up just being in microbiology for a long time, which is, I think, why I liked it so much when I got out a little bit and started doing clinical studies. I got to hit some of the other sections. So wages. <laughs> and, you know, you'll find a lot of variability in this. And I went back to, because I, I built this uh, about a year or two ago, and I went back to check. And I didn't change it because I still see pretty much the same range, price range on salaries. But it depends on where you're working to. And it just depends on you know how, how well they pay, so to speak, whether you're going to have um, a, a lab that's going to you know pay this much going in or maybe we'll start at a lower salary. Um, but this, is, this gives you a ballpark and it also gives you an idea of the array and how, as you, you can see, as you have more training, more licensing, more work put in basically, you're gonna yield a better, um, a higher salary um, going in the door. And so summary, if you're fascinated by science, like to solve puzzles, enjoy mysteries, like challenge and responsibility, communicate well, and set high standards for yourself, then career, consider a career in <laughs> clinical laboratory science. And I wanted to show you, this is my little family, my little lab family. <laughs> so obviously that's me and there's Natalie. And then this is my husband, as she mentioned, he's a pathologist. So he's a medical doctor um, and pathologists often, um, can take on the role of being a clinical laboratory director. And that's what he was at um, UCSF. So, um, and then last slide is just some of these professional organizations. And I would highly recommend visiting their websites. Um, they're gonna be able to give you a lot of information on um, you know, some of the specifics you're looking for, for um, uh, you know, like those very specific courses you need to take, what schools have training programs, what, tra you know, and give you good advice um, on um, what direction to take and how to, you know, how to get into the profession. So um, I'd be happy to take some questions. Um, I'm going to stop sharing and come back. It's a lot of information, I know. <laughs> And Anna, I'm very happy, to, uh, you've got this PowerPoint, so I'm very happy for you to share that with anyone and, and uh, peel off some of those links and stuff too. Awesome, thank you so much. We'll um, be sure to send it to all of these students so that they can go on the links if they'd like to. Um, now I'd like to open it up for any questions. Um, if you do not wanna talk out loud and take yourself off of mute, you can add it to the chat box um, and I'll give it about two minutes to do that. Um, while we get questions in the chat box, do you mind sharing a little bit of what your husband's profession is? Like, what is that yeah. job while everybody else is um, sure. getting the questions yeah. together? Yeah. Um, as I said, he's a medical doctor, so he, you know, went to med school. And uh, pathology is a specialty um, that, you know, just like dermatology or surgery or gynecology, you know, I mean, it's a specialty area of uh, med uh, medicine. And um, pathologists um, have two major uh, uh, divisions. One is called anatomic and one is called clinical. And anatomic pathology is like... Um, the pathologists who do the autopsies and they pathology is diagnosis of disease that's the the definition of the term and so through autopsies they may be able to diagnose what caused someone to pass away um, and so that's one major area of um, pathology and then clinical pathology is typically where you will find pathologists that run laboratories and clinical laboratories are required by, they're licensed by you know both nationally and, and state. They're licensed, and you have to have a pathologist as your director. 
there are some other medical categories categories that can be directors of laboratories also, but primarily it's pathologists. And if you're smart, you're going to use a pathologist because they've made a study of laboratory medicine. A best example probably would be um, a blood bank because um, there are a lot of different blood products that um, a physician who's treating a patient may choose from to treat that patient. And that's where a pathologist is particularly helpful in advising the physician what's the right product to use in this situation. So that's another one of those situations where we, um, where the laboratory needs to get involved with how to interpret and actually apply the information they got from the lab in treating the patient. A lot of the information we turn out, they can get it and go, oh yeah, okay, I see this antibiotic works, I'll use that. But when it comes to something like a blood product, they may need to consult with a pathologist in the laboratory to say, hey, should I be using pack cells? Should I be using platelets? What should I, you know, what should I be using here? What's the best course of action? And they get involved in, in those kind of consultations through all the different sections of the laboratory. So that's why you need that, you know, you need that medical doctor to doctor, so to speak, um, communication um, that, uh, and so that's why the clinical pathologists are so useful and helpful and, and so well suited for running clinical laboratories. Thank you so much. Um, it looks like we have three questions in the chat. Um, the first one is from Jas Jasmine Bencito, and she says, um, I'm interested in clinical lab scientists, sciences. How can I relate that to my additional interest in epidemiology? Where could I start? Wow, that's a good question. Um, epidemiology is um, something that would be uh, probably a state job. I'm not sure what the classification would be, but that's where you would find... Um, the most, um, I don't want to say interest, but or need or, you know, functioning sort of programs where they would be looking at diseases and um, their spread. That's something certainly that, or big organizations like World Health Organization um, and the, um, uh, I'm blanking on it right now, the, the um, U.S.'s um, Department of um, Oh, blanking on the name. Sorry, it's just I've lost it. It's right now so in the news because of COVID. Um, but they they are the kind of agencies that would do those epidemiological studies to um, you know track transmission of disease. Um, and uh, but being a clin lab tech is of course or clin lab scientist. Sorry, reverting here. Um, would be a, a good place to have a good foundation in um, uh, science and um, understanding um, the um, uh, markers that might go into uh, epidemiological studies. Um, let me ponder that one a little bit too, okay? And I'll, uh, I'll come back to it because it's a good question and, um, and it's certainly clin lab science isn't a bad place to start with for uh, a career if you're headed towards epidemiology. Thank you. Um, the next question is from, I'm really sorry if I butcher your name, but I think it's Jericho Alip Alipio. Um, and if I said it correctly, yay. And if I didn't, I'm sorry, please correct me. Um, but the question is what profession looks at cancer or studies cancer? So um, cancer, when I mentioned the leukemia, the blood cell slide we saw that had leukemia, um, that is cancer. That's a, you know, cancer of the, um, you know, um, uh, the blood system. And um, so the, um, depends on what you, where you want to look. If you want to look into, if you want, you're talking about research, then um, clin lab scientists definitely can be involved in research. A lot of, I was involved so long in the university uh, system. And so many, many of our um, pathologists 
had research labs associated with them also. And they operate on grants. So that was a part of the School of Medicine. That was part of a separate sort of operation that they did. They do their work in the lab, but then they would also have their own research uh, facilities. And so of course, many of them were, were um, doing uh, research on cancer. There's so many different um, aspects that uh, so many different things to look at as far as um, the diagnosis and treatment of cancer. Um, so, um, and that's in the hospital laboratory kind of setting, academic setting. And then there's research that's also being done in the private setting. So in um, the, you know, major, these major um, manufacturers, they're also, also trying to develop kits, testing kits for, you know, different ways to test for, um, um, you know, cancer and, and, and the diagnosis of cancer. So there's a lot, lot of application there. You know, there's a lot of ways to get involved in, um, if you have cancer research there, you know, it can be going into through the medical profession or through a clin lab science profession, working in a laboratory where they are doing research on cancer. Um, virus, um, same kind of thing. Virus uh, virology is one of the sections in, within a microbiology lab usually, and they do cultures of viruses to identify them. Um, and uh, then um, research, for, excuse me, manufacturers uh, are more likely to be doing studies on virus to try and identify uh, test kits that don't necessarily grow the viruses, but detect the viruses by detecting their, their antigen, uh, you know, some sort of uh, surface antigen on the virus. So also another, you know, area where you could go in and, 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 and uh, working with, um, you know, private sector too. So it's kind of a big question. It's and there's a lot of opportunity as a clin lab scientist, basically, to do either of those things. Can't work with cancer or work with viruses. Okay, and I think uh, this is our last question, um, so that we could be mindful of the time. So, how do you approach to volunteer at a laboratory or intern? And I think this well, is you know, as a I'm... high school student. Yeah, I know that there was a program. John Muir, because I remember seeing the interns um, one summer there at the Concord campus. And um, I think, you know, maybe that's something I should do is take a look at that and see. But I would think maybe Anna, even you could maybe call around and just see what um, hospitals are, you know, right now, of course, it's COVID and, you know, nobody's going anywhere, but, um, but they may have existing program. I know there have to be existing programs um, for, um, for students um, to go and, and do exactly that volunteer intern. Yeah, I think it's just a matter of calling the hospitals and, um, and seeing um, uh, what they've got to offer. Great, thank you so much. Um, we really appreciate your time, Sue. I'm trying to make sure that we stay in the time frame. Um, I know one of the things that was asked at the beginning is to take a picture so that we can um, put it on the, um, I believe it's the HOSA page. I don't remember exactly who asked. Um, so what I'm going to ask of everyone that's on the call right now is to make sure your cameras are on and that you're in the screen. Um, and then we're going to take the picture. And then after that, um, if you'd like to stay on, you're welcome to, but we'll stop recording after we take the picture. So... Um, if everyone can get in their screen, make sure your face is in the screen, not just your forehead <laughs> or your chin. Okay. Um, okay. So please hold off on typing in the chat box because it pops up on the pictures. Okay, so here we go. We're gonna do two. One, two, three. Okay, keep smiling in case you're on my other screen. Okay, one, two, three. Perfect. Okay, thank you all so much for joining. Um, we will let your teachers know who was here so that they can keep track of it for their records. Um, and then everyone else, you're welcome to log off. If you'd like to stay on and have any questions, you're welcome to. Thank you, goodbye.